Our next speaker is uh, John Mink, who is from the University of Rochester. Uh, he's the head of uh, child neurology there. He's also the recipient of the first Oliver Sacks Award by the Tourette Association of America. I have to throw that in, John. And welcome back to St. Louis, John. Thanks very much, Brad, and um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I uh, see some familiar faces here. I used to be uh, at WashU and moved to the University of Rochester 14 years ago, uh, but uh, some people never change. Brad used to have hair. So I'm going to do two things with my time. I'm going to talk about Tourette syndrome and other tick disorders. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what um, uh, we as pediatric neurologists think about when confronted with a child who has an acute or subacute onset of, for want of a better term, a neuropsychiatric syndrome, a syndrome with abnormalities on their neurologic exam as well as abnormalities in uh, behavior and uh, or cognition. Here are my disclosures. The only one that's at all relevant for what I'm talking about today is that the uh, Tourette Association of America buys me a rubber chicken dinner once a year at a Hilton Hotel, uh, but I don't have any uh, uh, financial conflicts uh, or uh, interests in uh, the topic I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to talk about ticks primarily. I'm going to talk about Tourette syndrome, and I'm going to talk about what uh, Harvey Singer and Roger Curlin and Don Gilbert and I unfortunately called CANS. Uh, but uh, with the point that there is a differential diagnosis to uh, disorders that present acutely in childhood with a constellation of neuropsychiatric symptoms. So first of all, what are tics? And we may have an opportunity to talk about chorea a little bit later today. Um, movement disorders in children, most movement disorders in children uh, present as repetitive involuntary movements as opposed to uh, uh, the paucity of movements that one might see in Parkinson's disease. And each type of movement disorder has characteristic spatial and temporal features that help us distinguish one from another. Unfortunately, that means that we end up stringing a lot of adjectives together to uh, describe the uh, disorders and distinguish them from others. But most of them also come with other characteristic clinical features. So ticks are stereotyped. Each tick happens pretty much the same way every time, but ticks can change over time. They're repetitive. They happen many times a day, nearly every day. They are involuntary, meaning children and adults who have tics don't do them on purpose. On the other hand, they often may have the sense that they have to do them. So some people have called them involuntary versus involuntary. They're intermittent. They're discrete. They're not rhythmic. And tics typically involve the head and the upper body, but they can involve other body parts. They happen many times a day, nearly every day, but that changes, and that changes with a number of features that I'll talk about um, in a bit. And they also change anatomic location and frequency and type and complexity and severity over time. So one of the hallmarks of tick disorders is that they change. One might get a new tick, an old tick may go away. Sometimes two old ticks may combine into a new tick that represents both of them. Um, without particular rhyme or reason in most cases. But ticks change. There's no test for ticks. Uh, the only test is to see someone who knows what ticks are. Uh, we take a very careful history, uh, and it's a very complex history. Uh, and um, we need to see the ticks. And if we don't see them when we're seeing the child in front of us, we uh, usually ask for a video so that we can see what the movements look like. Many children can reproduce their ticks. Children with chorea can't reproduce their chorea. Children with stereotopies, hand flapping for example, they typically can't reproduce their movements because most of the time they're not aware of what they're doing. Most things in neurology and probably in psychiatry too, if we don't fully understand them, we try to make sense out of things by categorizing them. And so ticks, we categorize as motor or vocal, sometimes we call that phonic. Any tick that produces a sound through the mouth or nose we call a phonic tick. But it's, I would argue, a very artificial distinction because even this, the phonic tics, the vocal tics, are caused by muscle contraction. Sometimes it may be very complicated. Many people, if you say Tourette's syndrome, they say, oh, that's the swearing disease. 
First of all, most people with Tourette's syndrome never do that. But second of all, although it's complicated, it's still a movement. It's just a movement that involves uh, the oral motor apparatus and airflow. Some tics can be very quick and jerky, and some can be more slow and twisty or slow and sustained, what we might call tonic. We also comp uh, categorize tics as simple or complex. Uh, simple tics are very simple movements. They look or sound purposeless, and complex tics may be much more elaborate uh, uh, or may be ensembles of more simple movements. Sometimes uh, the terms are used by uh, primary care physicians in a different way that a neurologist or psychiatrist may use them. So sometimes children are uh, referred with a question, is this simple tics, meaning is this not Tourette syndrome? Uh, because Tourette syndrome somehow has a different meaning. But when we talk about simple tics, we're talking about a particular type of movements. One of the things about tics that distinguishes them from other movement disorders is these are normal movements. What makes them abnormal is the context and the pattern in which they occur. They may be more forceful than comparable voluntary movements. They are definitely more frequent than comparable voluntary movements, but it's the context. So a child who's blinking his eyes um, you know, several dozen times a minute in a classroom, that's excessive. In a sandstorm, that's absolutely appropriate. And so a lot depends on the context. If I have an itch and I'm scratching, that's an appropriate movement. If I don't really have an itch, but I don't feel quite right, and I do this a lot, I might call that a tick, depending on the other context. So again, it's the context in which they occur that help us distinguish ticks. The median age at onset of seven years. Ticks can start as young as two or three years of age, but I've never really seen a child with a tick disorder have ticks start before two. And although ticks can start any time during childhood, and in fact there are some adult disorders where ticks may accompany the symptoms, uh, most definitions of the uh, tick disorders, the ticks have to start before age 18 years or sometimes age 21 years. I will tell you that someone who at age 16 has new onset of ticks is an outlier. Most, the great majority of children with tick disorders start sometime in the first decade of life. Most commonly, the initial symptoms eye blinking, 